Hey, Ty, sup? You, you, you made a grammatical error there. Sup is not grammatically correct. Oh, I don't know what the error is in that. Um, what is in the up? No, no, that's also not grammatically correct. You can say what is in the air or what is up, but no, it, no, that's just also incorrect. <laughs> what up, bro? Uh, I mean, I guess that's better. <laughs> 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 Hello, and welcome to Wolfo Wednesdays. Nathan reads a series of unfortunate events. Ignore the tattoo. My name is Nathan. And I'm Tyler. And we are talking about book the third in a series of unfortunate events. If you are new to this, I am reading through the series for the first time. Tyler is rereading the series. I am clearly the wrong age to be doing this. But um, in part, this is inspired from... Uh, stripped cover lit a great booktube channel with adrian reads and he's done this with a couple different books um where he reads through books that he's reading for the first time as an adult but they're young adult books and so and and his partner on that dalton has read the books and he read them at the appropriate age or the more targeted age so that's what we're doing each book we are separating into three different parts so this one is the first one that we're doing for the wide window book the third so we are looking at chapters one to four in this episode and uh we do have a sponsor for today yes yeah so our sponsor for today is pretty penny teething dolls their depictions of beauty may be toxic but the plastic is not <laughs> oh, that's great. So you can feel good about your toddler, your little infant, you know, chewing on its face. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's that's wonderful. Forget about all the other issues with that, but at least the plastic is not toxic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's all that's really important anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, folks, I hope you enjoy. Ignore the tattoo! Nathan unfortunately reads a series of unfortunate events at an unfortunate age, which in this case is being used to indicate that he is entirely too old to be reading this for the first time. All right, we're talking about Book the Third, The Wide Window from a series of unfortunate events. Uh, these books are written by Lemony Snicket, supposedly or ostensibly, because it's not really Lemony Snicket. That is a persona that the real writer, Daniel Handler, is taking on uh, because Snicket is essentially a character within this story universe. This book was first published in 2000 by, um, I believe this is HarperCollins. Yeah. Um, Harper Trophy. Um, so it's an imprint of Harper Collins. And uh, this, the first two books are printed in 1999, and this one came out in 2000. And you can tell that this is a first edition. All the ones that I've had access to so far uh, have been first editions. Well, I guess not the first one, but it says, you know that this is old when it says, visit us on the World Wide Web with an exclamation mark. <laughs> When people used to refer to it as that. The World yeah. Wide Web. Like there were other webs. Like on the local, not so wide, <laughs> the local narrow web. Visit us there. Yes. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, so it is. Um, uh, I guess we'll hop right into the uh, plot summary then. Yeah. Uh, all right. And I am doing it for uh, this episode. So the Baudelaire's have arrived on uh, Damocles Dock, which I will talk about later. Um, and uh, yeah, Mr. Poe is dropping them off into uh, in, into a cab, into the where the cab will take them to, uh, into the care of their new guardian, uh, Aunt Josephine, who isn't really their aunt, of course. Uh, um, another distant relative. Sister-in-law um, of a half cousin or something. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, some, something like that. Um, so upon meeting Aunt Josephine, they discover that she is afraid of everything. Uh, Absolutely. She, she is afraid of the lake in which her house is perched above. She is afraid of the stove, of using doorknobs. Um, the telephone. And, uh, the telephone. And of course, she is deathly afraid of realtors yes <laughs> yes yes um so then uh they proceed to have cold soup 
they go down to get groceries and run into Captain Sham. Fantastic name there. <laughs> uh, who is, of course, Count Olaf in disguise as the children can very easily see through. But unfortunately, Aunt Josephine does not believe their stories. Um, and uh, yes, and so then Count Olaf, a.k.a. Julio Sham, mm-hmm. <laughs> ends up calling uh, Aunt Josephine and um, uh, Aunt Josephine tells the children to go into the room to not eavesdrop. And then sometime later, several hours later, they hear a crash. They go into her grammar library and find that the wide window has been shattered and she has left a note for them, which uh, uh, states that she has taken her own life and left them in the care of Captain Sham. Yeah, that's apparently how inheritances work. Uh, right. Like, and determining, um, yeah, who, who gets to, like, guardianships, all of that. Yeah. That's how you get to do it. You can totally leave that in a suicide note. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Legally binding. I don't think that counts as sound mind. Just <laughs> Yeah. One would think, but in this community, in this community, I think right. it's okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So we'll, I, and I mean, I've, I've heard a little bit of criticism, like just a, a little bit that I, uh, a little bit of research that I've done with the series. There's been criticism that the books, the structure can be repetitive um Mm -hmm. and so i appreciate the fact that she dies so quickly in this yes (laughs) (laughs) right because it's like you know that because he's already established handler has already established by this point that he will kill off characters it's not just because on the one hand it's the books start out with the parents dying Mm -hmm. but they're not we haven't actually meet them yeah we haven't met them but then in in the second book, then we meet Uncle Monty and Handler takes, you know, a fair bit of care to establish that he's a good dude and they're going to have a good life with him. If only they could stay with him. And then he just kills him off. And so then it's like, oh, yeah, adults can definitely die in this. Uh, the Baudelaire children never seem endangered. So when you look at this and it's like, well, I'd rather not have to wait until however far into the story before she gets killed off. I thought that was, it was surprising at the very least. That yes. She, yeah, she no. dies as, she, as soon as she does. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and so it is, um, yeah, very early on. Uh, and the, uh, I, I, I think it would be very frustrating to have to read, you know, half or more of this book with with Aunt Josephine just commenting on everyone's grammar for the entire thing. Right. That that right. could get very tiring. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess we'll start with uh, the first chapter. And mm-hmm. you said you had something to point out when it comes to Damocles Doc. Yes. Um, yeah. So this is a bit of a broader uh, topic. Uh, the Sword of Damocles is a uh, a fairly popular uh, ex- expression. It refers to uh, a Greek uh, myth uh, or, or story in which um, Damocles is uh, brought into. Um, uh, he's like a a courtier. But the king allows him to be treated like a king for a day. Um, But Damocles, after just a short time of experiencing all these wonderful things, realizes that the king has also set a uh, uh, set a sword hanging by a single horsehair from the ceiling. Mm. Um, And so it is dangling over his head throughout everything. Uh, and then he is not able to enjoy any of the luxuries that he has just now uh, been given. Uh, and of course, with the opening illustration, then we do have the sword hanging uh, from Damocles' dock above the children's heads. Um, 
So it's a very, uh, very good allusion to that story because, of course, we have uh, the Baudelaire's who are in constant danger and never seem mm-hmm. to be able to take any joy. But then we also have Aunt Josephine, who is so terrified of literally everything that she right. takes no joy in anything except for grammar. <laughs> yes, that that is exactly it. Yeah, you're right. And I'm glad that you um, you went over that Um uh, because yeah, that's exactly it, and and you got it, you got it perfect. So that's great. <laughs> yes, and that is also the uh, origin of the uh, the expression "hanging by a thread." Oh, Just I didn't know that. FYI, yeah. So yeah, just something I uh, happened to uh, find when I was looking up the story of Damocles. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how long have you known this for? Oh, I just looked it up uh, this morning or last night. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I wasn't familiar with all of that. And so they say, and and this is kind of getting a little peek behind the um, behind the curtain and, and seeing like, you know, oh, the Wizard of Oz is actually just that dude. Here's a little peek behind the curtain of teaching. They say that um, the art of teaching is uh, making it like convincing your students that what you've known for 10 minutes, you've known your entire life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that as long as you say it with enough confidence and you just act, you, you know, you provide the whole history, you're just saying, this is what it means. And then they're like, wow, that person's just, they're so educated. They've known this for so long, but ultimately what difference does it make whether you've known it for decades or whether you've known it for minutes Right. You yeah. still know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Unlike dummies who just yeah. never learn anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I had always known that, like, Damocles clearly stands out as, you know, some kind of reference to something. Yes. Um, and, yeah, so it, I was very happy to, uh, you know, look it up yesterday and discover the actual meaning behind Damocles' dock. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, well, you convinced me that you knew the story for a long time. And, uh, I mean, this is is another little trick when it comes to interpreting literature for anybody watching this. Then, especially if you know that the writer is being fairly um, careful in their naming of either characters or places or things, then just look up the history of those names. And then you can usually get some insight into what the author is trying to achieve. Uh, it doesn't always work because sometimes authors just randomly use names, but I'm saying right. if you're pretty sure that they're doing something with it, then, and especially if you're like, if you're still in school or anything like that, then it is a good way to impress your teachers. Yeah. Right. Like it, it usually opens up good interpretive um, avenues from that. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think that that is a, a great way to start off uh, this book in particular um, with it being so much about, about that. I mean, we even have the anxious clown as a restaurant. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was going to say, cause that is just such a great um, illustration, like such a great story that illustrates what it's like to live with anxiety, that mm-hmm. good yeah. things can be, can be happening, but you don't feel at ease. You just feel yeah. like, but things could end disastrously at any moment. So I can't appreciate any good thing that's happening to me right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's. I think it's more clever than what we've seen so far in this series, as far yes. as like his playfulness with names. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, because it prior to this, it's been a lot of uh, you know just alternate words for bad. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. Okay. Um, you get a couple like plays with like the fickle fairy and Lake Lacrimose. Mm-hmm. Right? Lacrimose yeah. is like weeping or sadness and fickles like you can't make up your mind. So he's always doing this alliterative, alliterative stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. The next note that I had was on uh, page six, um, just between <laughs> when Violet says, uh, what does that word mean? Mr. Poe looked at Violet and raised his eyebrows. I'm surprised at you, Violet, he said. A girl of your age should know that a taxi is a car which will drive you someplace for a fee. Now let's gather your luggage and walk to the curb. Dowager, Klaus whispered to Violet, is a fancy word for widow. Yeah. 
<laughs> I like that he doesn't, you know, that it's a whispering conversation. And then, of course, Violet, thank you. She whispered back. It's just, it. it's a fun moment. And, of course, Mr. Poe continues to be completely oblivious. <laughs> it is a fun moment. Yeah, I had that marked as well because uh, what Mr. Poe says is, before this, he, he says, it didn't seem to polite to ask how she became a dowager. Well, let's put you in a taxi. And then Violet says, what does that word mean? And then he says, I'm surprised at you, Violet. A girl of your age should know that a taxi is a car which will drive you someplace for a fee. And there's, to me, there's a couple funny things about this. It's, one, it's that he is obviously defining the word that really doesn't need the definition. Right, right? yes. That is like, yeah. But then I think the other joke is that, like, I don't know, it's, I guess he does already know what dowager means, but it's just, it's such an interesting thing that he doesn't know what she doesn't know. Right, yeah. And um, I don't know, it's it's just, it's it's I guess it's more of what we've seen from Mr. Poe, but the fact that Klaus just has no interest in even trying to bring this up argue. to Mr. Poe. Yeah. yeah, to argue <laughs> with him. It's just like, because at the end of the last book, then he just sighs, he just gives up. He's like, right. I'm always explaining yeah. things to this dude, so. Yeah, and and it, and we definitely don't get you know Klaus's uh, I guess iconic from the last book. We, we know, know what, taxi what means. the word taxi yeah. means. We were asking about Dowager, <laughs> right? Um, so I like that. It's a little bit of growth with uh, with Klaus. <laughs> it is, yes. Um, and that was all that I had for chapter one. Okay, I've got a couple things um, on page. Three, then you get another instance of Snicket pointing out what most 14 year olds do or what can be described, like how you can describe most 14 year olds. Um, mm. He did this in book one where it says, this is the, the um, paragraph, the one paragraph that you have on the page there. Thank you, Mr. Poe, Violet said, and took the paper bag and peered inside. Like most 14 year olds, Violet was too well mannered to mention that if she ate a peppermint, she would break out in hives, a phrase which here means be covered in red itchy rashes for a few hours. Uh, you know, he's making an assumption about most 14 year olds. Right. right? And he's like kind of like done that phrase before. Um, yeah. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out that you get another instance of that. And then the other thing is on page nine at the bottom of it. I guess I'll start with like the second last paragraph on that page where you have this discussion of the hurricane where, um, the the driver the cab driver is talking about this about hurricane herman is expected to arrive in town in a week or so you better make sure you have enough food up there in the house a hurricane on a lake klaus asked i thought hurricanes only occurred near the ocean and then um yeah so then he says a body of water as big as lack as lake lacrimose the driver said can have anything occur on it to tell you the truth i'd be a little nervous about living on top of this hill once the storm hits it'll be very difficult to drive all the way down into town and then i just put a little note i guess he doesn't need to point out the foreshadowing again because right. yeah. he's already established he already like took great pains to to explain to his readers what is foreshadowing? Why do writers use it? How is it being used? What's the purpose? And he did that in the last book. And that's very mm -hmm. obvious foreshadowing. And I yes. think most good readers, like like I, I say, like I'm talking specifically about children. So most good um, readers who are children who read that should catch that. Yes. And yeah. it's nice that he's not constant. He's, as these texts are, I'm saying in many ways they are didactic texts of educating mm -hmm. the reader as they go on what stories do and the little literary devices and narrative devices that writers employ to tell a story that he's at least saying it once and then not saying it again. Right. Yes. Because if he's yeah. just constantly saying, and this children or and this boys and girls is an <laughs> example of foreshadowing, then I'd be like, ah. Well, it doesn't work so well if you just point it out directly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we do uh, get that reference to the uh, incoming hurricane, uh, which is very clear foreshadowing. Uh, and he it's less direct foreshadowing, which is great, yes. compared to in Book the Second, where he very directly says, you know, that Uncle Monty will not survive this episode. And, yeah. 
Yeah. Because he says that it's foreshadowing, and I'm like, no, it's not. You just slapped us in the face with it. That's (laughs) foreshadowing supposed to be a hint where we go, (laughs) ooh, I think that's significant. I'm going to watch for that. But when he just slaps you in the face and says, this will happen, then I'm like, well, no, you've just overtly told us. You've explicitly said what will happen. So it's not foreshadowing because it's not a hint. It's not a clue. Mm -hmm. It's um, just exposition. So that's it. So he kind of had screwed up the definition of foreshadowing or the example that he gives is not a good example, but here it works. So, yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. That was all I had for, for chapter one. So we can move on to chapter two. Perfect. Do you want me to go first with perfect. this one? Sure. All right. Um, I've only got a couple notes for it. So. Um, On page 33, I hope he's doing what I think he's doing here. This is Aunt Josephine talking about her her deceased husband. (laughs) Then it says, okay, like, because you're laughing, then I'm assuming you think this too. I I believe he is. So I'll just read that paragraph in the middle of the page. She says, that's all right, Aunt Josephine said, blowing her nose. It's just that I prefer to think of Ike in other ways. Ike always loved the sunshine, and I like to imagine that wherever he is now, it's as sunny as can be. Of course, nobody knows what happens to you after you die, but it's nice to think of my husband someplace very, very hot, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, did that come out the way you wanted it to come out? That it's, oh, I just like thinking that he's in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? No, it's such a great moment. <laughs> okay, I wanted to make sure uh, that, um, yeah, because it seems very yeah. obvious that that's the implication here. It's subtle yeah. enough that it's going to go over a lot of kids' heads when they're reading Ooh. this, but the ones who get it are going to love that, yes. I think. And <laughs> yeah, I find absolutely. those are the best jokes, right? Because yeah. I've often said this before in the, the classroom that, you know, I'll have people say to me, oh, like, you're, you're so funny, your, your students must love you. And I'm like, no, very few think that I'm funny. The rest of them think that I'm a complete idiot because I say sarcastic things all the time. And so the dumb ones they don't catch that I'm being sarcastic. So they just think that I'm just completely oblivious to a whole bunch of things. And then the really smart kids laugh. And so typically I'll have like five or six kids in the classroom who are laughing and the rest of them are like, what's wrong with this guy? (laughs) Right. (laughs) To me, those are the best jokes. The the jokes that just go over most people's heads and everybody's just like, was that even a joke? Why are other people laughing? And it's like, never mind. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Because, yeah, it very easily could have read, you know, very, very warm. He said but no. warm. He says very, very hot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I do. Uh, I had that point marked as well. It's a great little little joke there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she says this and it's like, is that really what you like to think of about your husband? <laughs> like, I just feel like the Baudelaire's like Violet and Klaus would kind of like look at each other and just kind of, you know, do the side eye thing. Like, um, <laughs> right. did she just say she, she, she's happy when she thinks about her husband burning in hell. Cause, um, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then on page 34, then, um, Snicket here is saying that, um, uh, He's talking about the difference between rational and irrational fears. And then he says, or in simpler terms, fears that make sense and fears that don't. For instance, the Baudelaire orphans have a fear of Count Olaf, which makes perfect sense because he's an evil man who wants to destroy them. But if they were afraid of lemon meringue pies, this would be an irrational fear because lemon meringue pie is delicious and has never hurt a soul. Being afraid of a monster under under the bed. And then you get this. It's a setup because he's he's setting up a joke here. So then kids are like, right, yeah, when I'm scared about the monster under the bed the bed that's irrational because mm-hmm. you know it just doesn't make any sense and then he yeah. says uh it's perfectly rational because there may in fact be a, mo- a monster under your bed at any time ready to eat you all up <laughs> but a fear of realtors is an irrational fear and so he doesn't even say a monster under a bed or right. <laughs> the bed he says yeah. your bed so <laughs> yeah and you can imagine that a lot of these kids are reading it in bed and then they're just hey don't say that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i know absolutely um if a kid had a fear of you know monsters under the bed and they are reading this book oh man <laughs> that would get yeah. them so much if they're <laughs> if they're young enough then yeah it would it would work i think most kids are gonna look at that and they'll just giggle 
Right. But if he's catching a kid who's young enough, who's still genuinely concerned about this, and they're not catching all of the sarcasm and irony in these books, then, um, yeah. yeah, that's a, I, yeah, it's not going to, it's going to unsettle them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I really had for chapter two. Okay. Uh, I had one other note for chapter two, which was on page, uh, bottom of page 27. Um where uh, jo Aunt Josephine is describing her uh, late husband, Ike. Um, and she says, uh, let me see. Uh, he was my husband, but he was much more than that. He was my best friend, my partner in grammar, and the only person I knew who could whistle with crackers in his mouth. Our mother could do that, Klaus said, smiling. Her specialty was Mozart's 14th symphony. Ike's was Beethoven's fourth quartet, Aunt Josephine replied. Apparently, it's a family characteristic. I like this moment just because it's finally actually, you know, making it clear that they are somehow related to these people. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a family character. When he goes to such pains to, you know, make sure that we know that these are tangentially related to him uh, to to the children then um then yeah that's just a really good moment of oh well the like uh their uncle ike i guess then he would have been uh blood related um to them but aunt josephine is just uh an in-law as it were um you know like just married into the family right and so then, I, I just go ahead i just think that it's uh really good that we get that li like that little connection there of okay yeah i guess they really are somewhat related and mr poe isn't just pulling this all out of the <laughs> thin air but they're not because so that's why i think it's kind of funny because she's saying that it must be what does she say a family characteristic mm -hmm. how, how does she put it yeah. Uh, oh. Uh, oh my goodness. Yeah, I just lost. It's there. okay. Because then the description for her, it then says, your Aunt Josephine, she's not really your aunt, of course. She's your second cousin's sister-in-law. So she's not related to them. But then she has the same family characteristic as... Well, but she doesn't. It was... Uh, Ike. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. Go yeah. ahead. So Ike would have been related to them yes. by blood. Thank you. She's only yeah. related through marriage. My mind wandered off. So you're you're right. right. No worries. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was the only uh, other comment that I had for uh, chapter two. Okay. Um, I don't have much with chapter three. I don't know about you. Yeah, I. I don't think I have much uh, left for uh, chapter three or four, but uh, in chapter three, let me see. Uh, trying to make sure that this doesn't go into uh, chapter four. Uh, yeah, so on the bottom of page 49, um, then we get uh, Aunt Josephine being completely uh oblivious to um to captain sham um yeah, so let me double check where was my no oh yes uh in the middle of the page uh violet tried one more time knowing it would probably be futile uh or futile a word which here means filled with futility he's yes. not <laughs> captain captain sham she says he's I just, I really love that, that again, he's playing with this, like, he's defining a word, but just like, that wouldn't help anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, I have that marked as well. And I remember that before um, one of my English teachers had explained that to us because we had to do definitions for um, different books that we were reading. And it was just again and again, then students in class would define the word, but they would use the word in their definition. <laughs> Right. And it is like and she would say, like, like that's basically the one thing that you can't do when you're defining a word. So if you're <laughs> yeah. defining the word futile, then you can't say 
Futile, it is. it means something that is futile or an act of futility. And then you're like, that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So um, yeah. I think it's, it's kind of a common thing, though, because if you ask, uh, you know, especially somebody who's younger or somebody who doesn't exercise that skill very often, you say, mm -hmm. OK, can you define that word? Then it can be challenging because it's basically like yeah. that that game. I forget what it is. Like, anyway, there's different like games taboo. like taboo. Yeah. Where it's yeah. like you have to describe something, but you can't say that word or a few other ones that are too closely related to it. Yeah. Uh, that it is yeah. kind of challenging to do. But yeah, it is fun that he's playing around with these definitions, because yeah. at first when he's just overtly giving us <laughs> definitions and the literal meaning that I'm like, this is so tedious. I don't. But because he, he it's a setup to then start subverting his own voice yeah. which yeah. is fun absolutely uh all right so the only other note that i had for chapter three was on page 50 um uh and it is of course uh that sounds delightful aunt josephine said reading his card captain sham's sailboats every boat has its own sail oh captain you have made a very serious grammatical error here what Captain Sham said, raising his eyebrow. This card says it's with an apostrophe. I-T apostrophe S. Always means it is. You don't mean to say every boat has it is own sail. You mean simply I-T-S, belonging to it. It's a very common mistake, Captain Sham, but a dreadful one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just, yes. Everybody needs to learn that. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I have far more sympathy for the fact that um, I know that it infuriates you. And yeah. I don't know. I think in part because I've worked with, because on the one hand, if you, anybody who watches or listens to this, then you'll know that I do kind of, I, I don't have a lot of patience for stupid people, but that's not really true. The thing is that I have no patience for stupid people who believe that they're smart. That's mm. what drives me crazy. The worst kind of stupid is the stupid that thinks it's, you know, they're a genius. That yeah. drives me nuts. Somebody who's so confident in what they're saying, but mm -hmm. they, they're they really dumb. And they think that smart people, that they're smarter than people who are more intelligent in that particular domain than they are. So that infuriates yeah. me to no end. But because I've taught long enough and I've taught like a whole bunch of different, um, you know, groups, a whole bunch of different um, kids, I've worked with enough students where I know how highly intelligent they can be. But if they have whatever issues, whether it's, um, you know, dyslexia or dysgraphia or other learning disabilities, then, and you, according to their IEP, typically if they're identified, then it'll be in their IEP, their individual education plan, that you, um, you'll, you'll see um, accommodations that we provide where we will ignore spelling and grammar. And then you just look at content. So I look at that now, like with people who make these mistakes between two, two, and two, right? Or right. not knowing where apostrophes go. Sometimes it's that they really are just a lazy writer and they've never bought, they're intelligent enough. They have no learning disabilities. They're capable of knowing the difference. Other times it's baffling to them. Like when you work with a kid who's got like dyslexia and dysgraphia long enough, as I did um, with what one student in particular, where um, I, I worked with him for quite a while. And um, that, I mean, like, b's and p's and d's lowercase he, he couldn't tell right. the difference so then you're like i mean good luck with trying like he was super smart um like he he really he's got a great mind but i look at that and i'm like when people get so angry online about that <laughs> with people who make mistakes then i'm like yes um sometimes i think it's justified it, yeah it, it it doesn't uh it doesn't make the entire uh statement or argument invalid which it's some just... people online seem to think yes <laughs> yeah they... and that is that is wrong when people call people out for that that's right yeah but uh but yeah i just uh i really do think 
that that is um uh it, like it yeah it does bother me when people make those errors and uh but of course this is count olaf so of course he would make a mistake like that <laughs> right and that's the thing he's like setting it up that he doesn't and this is where i'm a little confused so he's setting it up that he is not that count olaf is not a good writer that he makes mistakes when it comes to grammar and punctuation and spelling um and he's doing that in part to set up the the letter that we get the the suicide note but the other thing though then her saying you know it's a very common mistake but a dreadful one that i'm like well which one is it because <laughs> if it's common to me if i would say it's a common mistake it doesn't mean like this is a terrible one i i right. tell my students that all the time i'm like it's super easy to fix it's not like if they're they're writing and it's just like you're so far off from where this needs to be that it's going to take a long time to fix it's right oh yeah. this is an easy fix no big deal but yeah um yeah the, the only other thing that i have to say about captain sham's sailboats is what a terrible slogan uh <laughs> every boat has its own sail um just i don't know i feel like it should it, it could be so much better and i know that this is all for the act but you know just um i don't know sales like sales for every boat you know and it's just right for sales on every every boat uh has its sales or something you know and just something that plays with you know with the homonym of sale <laughs> right being on sale well, do you think that he's playing around with sham that he's trying to do a pun on that captain sham because like a sham cover for your like pillows oh. like for throw pillows that's how i read it that oh, it's okay. supposed to be funny that it's like every ship has got its own sail and i'm like is it really just like a pillowcase is that what these, right. <laughs> is that what your sails are they're sham covers <laughs> like, these are shams <laughs> huh. yeah that's interesting i had not considered that okay. yeah that's what i thought i'm like captain sham and i'm like and then it's like every ship has its own sail I'm like it's funny because that's what my mind did, but I don't <laughs> right. know that that's what he was doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's all I had uh, for chapter three. Okay. Yeah, I'm good with chapter three. And I've only got one note for chapter four. And then um, I don't know about you, but we could kind of have a bit of a discussion then about things broadly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I only had one note for chapter four as well which is of course the uh the letter that mm. is written to the children okay um, so if you had another note then maybe let's uh talk about that first yeah so this is on page 57 because this is before the letter so he's talking about like Aunt Josephine is convinced that Captain Sham must actually be a captain who really is selling or renting out these ships that have got sales, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she's saying because it's on his business card, right? And then yes. um, Snicket then gets into this. Um, so that's start, starting with the main paragraph on that page on 57. Aunt Josephine put the business card down on the dinner table and the Baudelaire's looked at it inside. Business cards, of course, are not proof of anything. Anyone can go to a print shop and have cards made that say anything they like. The King of Denmark can order business cards that say he sells golf balls. Your dentist can order business cards that says she is your grandmother. In order to escape from the castle of an enemy of mine, I once had cards printed that said I was an admiral, an admiral in the French Navy. Just because something is typed, whether it is typed on a business card or typed in a newspaper or book, this does not mean that it is true. The three siblings were well aware of this simple fact, but could not find the words to convince Aunt Josephine. Uh, and so it's this nice little moment of metafiction that yeah. he's telling us, you know, these things are all true. It all actually happened to the Baudelaire's and trying to convince us that this story world is actually because he's doing like little um, um, tricks, especially with the 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 paratext of like letters mm -hmm. to the editor where he's inserted himself into the story where he's saying like, I am desperately trying to get word of the misfortune of the Baudelaire's to the world. And I've, you know, gone through all these different publishers trying to find somebody who will print this to be able to tell their story. Cause it's important to tell their story. And it's like trying to make it seem like 
this really happened. And then he's undercutting all of it saying, hey, just because it's in a book doesn't mean it's real, which yeah. it's just it's a nice little moment of metafiction. And it's subtle enough that I think it's it works better than mm -hmm. if he just said stuff that you read in books is not true, except for this story, of course. Like if he said something like that, right, <laughs> it would just be too overt. But he's, you know, for children's lit, it's a fairly subtle um, mm -hmm. moment of metafiction. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I did, I think, initially have that marked, but I'm trying to cut down on how many yeah. notes I have. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, all right, so then we do have uh, the letter that was written to the children. Um, and... My goodness, don't don't you just want to go through and edit this whole letter? <laughs> no, I have worked as an editor. I do it all the time with grading. I never have the desire to edit now to correct somebody else's writing. I'm just like, no, it's like, I'll pay you. I already get paid to do that. I don't want to do more of it. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it's it's got all kinds of errors in it. Um yeah. yeah, it's a it's a funny letter. It's really funny Absolutely. him trying to capture her voice and yeah. trying to like it's like I think it'd be a fun like fun fun in a super grim sense writing exercise to try to write a suicide note for somebody else. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not yeah. saying this like in real life, but I'm saying like as like in a in a fiction workshop to take to write that for a fictional character and. Right. Yeah. Especially in these silly books where there are so many characters are absurd. Yeah. But yeah, how no, do you absolutely. how do you make that convincing in this story universe? Like if it was a convincing suicide note, would it not be surprising? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um yeah. There there's so much fun with it and it's I, I think the the most interesting uh, error to me is my heart is as cold as Ike, and I find life unbearable. Mm. Of course, later on, then we have um, uh, uh, to this desperate act, and of course the uh, the C has been replaced by a K there. So you're like. Oh, so my heart is as cold as Ike could easily have also been my heart is as cold as ice. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just that, that that's the one in particular that I really love. Um, but it is just so fun to to read through it and be like, oh, that's not right. That That's not right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great point. I guess the thing is, and the reason why I... I, I was not thrilled with this. I feel like this is, I, I don't know, an inconsistency in Olaf's character. He wrote the play in The Bad Beginning, and it wasn't this poorly written. Right. So there, he's now saying he's a terrible writer and he can't help but make all of these errors. Um, and that's going to be ultimately his undoing, certainly, right? Because she's this grammar-obsessed woman, and now they've got their proof that this could not possibly be the note that she wrote because she would never make these errors and, you know, things like they're going to catch on. Oh, this can't be her because it's he's not using or she, she didn't use the possessive form of it's. Um, mm -hmm. instead she used the contraction of it is instead of the possessive it's, um, with that, that first instance of it. And she had just corrected him and they know that he doesn't know the difference between a contraction of it is and the possessive form of it's. So mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's obviously what's happening, which again, listen, folks, I'm not boasting. I'm not bragging. It's not impressive that I'm seeing through children's lit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'd say that's obvious obvious what's happening here or what's going to happen but wasn't count olaf a better writer than this in the first book quite possibly the yeah. the play was poorly written in terms of plot and mm -hmm. characterization and theme 
but it wasn't i mean i guess it's a little bit hard to tell like certainly with punctuation like that it might be hard to tell but things like unbearable right right and then if he wrote it you know if he said my my heart is as cold as ike right and it should be ice but mm. he doesn't know the difference between c's and k's um right. the and like phonetically the the difference between um how they're pronounced and so i don't know i'm just saying that in the play that he wrote he didn't have people saying weird words mm -hmm. yeah we'll have to uh see how all of this plays out um, okay how this letter uh is used later but, okay uh, yeah <laughs> all right so it's just stuff that you can't reveal to me maybe <laughs> all right that's fine yeah um all right so you wanted to do a, a little bit of a broader discussion uh, just if you had any kind of final thoughts over like these four chapters uh not not particularly um uh yeah we we are already um getting a little bit of the play on the formula that he has set up but it is still pretty formulaic uh with them you know meeting a new relative count olaf showing up in disguise and then them having to uh and then count olaf somehow uh getting rid of their guardian into uh in order to steal their fortune. Um, but I like that we do get, you know, and Josephine is gone this early in the story. Yeah. Um, and there's not really much that's subtle about it. It just throws her out a window. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he also seems to be threatening them, like, far more directly. Where mm -hmm. yeah, it's which not is so much, I have to keep you alive and come up with this entire ruse it's more just like, well, I'll kill you. <laughs> and yeah. How's that going to help them get their fortune? <laughs> right. It's not yeah. like in a video game if you kill a character and then like they kind of like disappear and all their coins show up and you can pick <laughs> them up. Like. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, it seems like there's a little bit of a turn there in the story because before he was like at least in the bad beginning, it was this devious plot to dupe them into uh, you know participating in this play to then be able to marry Violet and from that then it made sense of how he would get their fortune but in the last book it's just I'm going to take you to Peru because they're not going to be, be able to investigate your deaths as well but how do you get the fortune from that and with this yeah. I'm going to take out Aunt Josephine and he really threatens them um, in the story, I forget exactly what he says, but he's very overt about threatening them. And, mm. and then, um, you know, there's no plan, though, to actually get their their fortune. Yeah, well, they, they are left in the care of Captain Sham. Um, but, yes, outside of that, then there doesn't seem to be... I, I, I do think that you're onto something there, where he does seem more interested uh, in uh, revenge rather than obtaining their fortune. Yes. Yes. Because um, that does seem to be the, the case. Because mm -hmm. I'm trying to find the exact passage of, of where he meets them in the store, but... Um, in any case, it's fine because he does seem to be much more intent on, yeah, getting revenge against them instead mm -hmm. of acquiring the fortune. And I don't really get that, but okay. I mean, it's it's fine if that's where the story's going, but I guess it's already breaking the formula. Right. Yeah. And if he really was intent on just killing them without coming up with some dastardly plan to acquire their fortune, then presumably it'd be easy enough to kill them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he does seem to have, uh, I guess, mixed, uh, mixed intentions. Does he want to just kill them or does he want yeah. to, uh, obtain their fortune? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm saying I'm looking at this and I'm going, I'm puzzled. I don't really know what 
he's intending to do here. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure how kids would be able to immediately understand what it is. But right. Yeah. It's fine. Like, like, I'm not upset by it or anything. I'm just like, oh, that's interesting because that's not what we had before in this series. So Right. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think we're, we're done then with these chapters, right? And we'll move on to the next four. Yep. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching, folks, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Ignore the tattoo. A phrase here which means like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast across the web. That may seem like a strange definition, but in this context, it is entirely accurate.